Good morning. Welcome to uh, Third Church, and a special welcome to all our visitors here. If we've got family visiting or uh, children home for the holidays, uh, just welcome you here today. Uh, my name is Dan Belzer, and I am not the uh, minister. Um, one of the great things that we've tried to do here, especially in the auditorium, is to get more and more folks together uh, to bring the word. And uh, as we um, learn about our gifts and our talents, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about sacrifice, and really, what are we giving up for the Lord? And how can we use our gifts to serve Him? And that's one of the things that Keith has really tried to do with our auditorium staff, is to start challenging us to come out of the seats and uh, to try our hand at uh, really preaching the Word and, and reaching out to um, folks in need. So uh, again, thank you for being here today. Um, I want to take you back 35 years ago from today. Okay, so what year is that? Does anybody know? 1981. Does anybody remember 1981? It was a great year, wasn't it? It was an awesome year. So I want to take you back to 1981, um, 35 years ago from today. And uh, it was the 4th of July, obviously, 4th of July uh, holiday week. And um, I grew up in southern Iowa. So I grew up in Albia and we had a ton of rain, a ton of rain, so much so that the ditches filled up, the waterways filled up, and, um, you know, for me, growing up out in the country uh, with my brothers, and uh, I'll show you a picture of my family here, Uh, they'll bring it up here. So this is a a photo from uh, probably the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, my parents, uh, obviously, I'm the, the, the one to the left, the family photo, and I'm in the center, as, as where I was, at least what my brothers think, the rest of my life, I was in the center. Uh, but uh, I was the youngest of uh, three, uh, my oldest brother, Bill, uh, my brother, Paul, and then myself in the middle. And uh, just to kind of think about back in the 1981, so I grew up in the country, uh, and, you know, since we didn't go to town very much, you know, we saw this this ditch full of water. Well, what are kids going to do? They're going to go swimming, right? So we had a couple friends over, we threw our trunks on, and we run out to the ditch. And we were splashing, having a great time. Well, just about a quarter of a mile down the road is our waterway, right, between two fields. What do you think that looked like? It was full. So, I mean, if you can have a so I, I was pretty young, so probably, I was probably about the age of the picture, the family picture. So I stayed in the kiddie pool and up by the ditch, and then my brothers saw this waterway, and they're like, let's run down there. So, so they run down there to the water, and they are swimming in the water. And uh, my dad comes out of the house yelling. He was like, where are they at? Where are they at? I said, uh, they, they, they went down to the waterway. He's like, get in the car. So we got in the car, the old uh, Silver Streak station wagon, Ford LTD. And my dad tears out of the driveway and he drives down the gravel road to the bottom of the hill. So I'm going to show you the next slide. So most, wa- most waterways, most gravel roads, there's culverts, right? So I would say the gap between the top of the culvert and the top of the water is about this much. So can you, do you know why my dad was upset? So he slams the car into park. He jumps out. I think there was the, one kid had not gotten in, or not gotten in the water yet. And uh, he yells at my brothers to get out. And so they're swimming. I remember my brother Paul, who's the middle one. He goes to go underneath the barbed wire fence. And he goes into the tube. So my oldest brother Bill reacts. He starts, the, 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 the uh, current of the river is so strong uh, that it pulls him in. And then my brother Bill grabs on my brother's foot. So he, my brother's already in the tube. Paul's already in the tube. My brother has, has holding my brother's feet, or his foot. And then he takes his foot and he locks it on the bottom of the culvert, right? Trying to hold back the pressure. And he's trying to pull him. It's way too strong. So he lets go. My brother lets go. And uh, they go in the tube. What's my dad do? He goes into the tube too. 
So here I am, think about my age up here, and I'm watching my whole family go underneath the, this gravel road. And you think about, if you've ever been around culverts before, a lot of times they'll put fencing up next to it, or, you know, so livestock can't get through or whatever. Um, the, God, the Lord shined on us that day. So everybody went through the tube. And I remember Brother Paul, I, said, I asked him, I said, what did you do? And he said, I don't know. I just reached up and there was a tree limb and I grabbed onto it as he got through the tube. And he was, and he was okay. The only injury that we suffered that day was my brother poked his foot on the end of that culvert and it sliced his foot down to the bone. So we took him to the hospital, mom and dad took him to the hospital, he got 30 stitches that day. But I am thankful that that's it. Because the, the, the life, now think about this, so that my life would have been totally different if it had just been my mom and I, right? But thank the Lord that uh, everything was okay. And uh, of course the next day was the Bussy uh, 4th of July party, and did we go? Of course. We, went, so we couldn't miss the Bussy 4th of July parade. So my brother went there on crutches. Um, but what I want to talk about today is sacrifice. We've been studying the book of Mark and walking through that gospel, which is a phenomenal gospel. And today we, we, come, ac- we come across scripture where Jesus starts to predict his death. And he does it three times. So obviously my brother's my brother, oldest brother and my dad sacrificed himself that day, right? And usually it's pretty easy for us to sacrifice for our family. But what does that look like past that? What, and do I really understand sacrifice? As I've been studying the book of Mark, I'm like, do I really understand sacrifice? Do I really understand the sacrifice that Christ made? And I can tell you the disciples struggle with it as well. And we'll read about that. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the freedom that we have to be in this country. I thank you for the freedom that we have from sin. I thank you for allowing me to have a family even after that great event. Um, And I thank you for just the significant sacrifice you made. Lord, I I pray that you would pierce our hearts with your word. And Lord, that these words would be yours, not mine. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would descend upon us and that uh, we would all be blessed by um, your word. Amen. So let's go to uh, Mark. If you've got Bibles, uh, electronic devices, uh, go ahead and open those now. We're going to go to chapter, um, we're going to chapter 8, and we've got it up on the board too. We've got Bibles in the back uh, if you'd like to grab one. So 8, 30, 31, 32, I'm going to read it here. So Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. So Jesus does a great job telling stories. He does a great job in parables. But what's interesting about the scripture is Jesus spoke plainly. He wasn't trying to tell a story. He's like, guys, here's the facts. This is what's going to happen. So he's speaking plainly. How did how does the disciples react? How, how, did, how did Peter react? Well, let's go on. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, recommended, don't rebuke Jesus. It's a bad idea. Okay. Do we understand? Did Peter understand? Obviously, Peter did not understand because he's rebuking Jesus. And I think about us, and when we come in contact with folks, and when they sacrifice, or they, make, they choose to move to another country, they choose to change jobs, they choose to do something different, and sometimes what's our reaction? Like, really? You're really going to do that? You're really going really to move away? You're really going to do that? And I think what happens is, and obviously it's happened to Peter, is pride. Pride is coming. Pride that, G, that Peter knows more than what Jesus knows. What's the opposite of pride? What's the opposite of pride? Being humble. Right, being humble. Jesus was a humble 
sacrifice. And I think, you know, pride is not a sacrifice. And humble is a sacrifice. I want to tell you about a story about a minister. Uh, he's a traveling minister. And uh, we've got a picture of him and his family. Um, he was a very successful traveling minister. Uh, actually, in the southwest part of the United States. And as he, as he continued to travel more and more, um, he began to become more and more known in the southwest part of the United States. His ministry was growing. He was affecting more people. He was a Na- Nazarene uh, minister. Well, he, they only had one son. And you can see here the, the picture of him and his son. And as he traveled, he spent more and more time away from his family. So as the boy grows, what does the boy do? He begins to challenge his mother. Right? Dad's not around. I'm going to start to push mom around. So frantically, the traveling minister's mother or wife calls and says, you need to come home. I can't handle him anymore. You need to come home and, and take care of the son. He drops his whole traveling ministry. He takes a, a, a church in Southwest, or Southern California and decides that he's going he's to be there to raise his son and take care of his family. Some of us may look at that and say, well, he had this huge ministry. Some of us may rebuke him and say, Are you, you're going to give all that up? Really? You're going to give all that up? You're just going to go to a local church and you're just going to, you're going to do the local church things, a small church? Your impact is going to be so much smaller. Here's the interesting part. Kate, you want to show the next slide? The traveling minister's son was James Dobson. So Jim C. Dobson was a traveling minister in the southwest part of the United States. His wife called him and said, honey, I need you. I need you to sacrifice your success, and I need you to come home and take care of your son. And most of us know, folks on the family, um, out of Colorado Springs, Colorado, huge ministry. Think of how that would have changed, right? If James, Dr. James Dobson would not have had his dad there, Jim, there would not be focus on the family, not as big as the impact of that. And so do we really know? Do we really know the sacrifice that Christ made? And, and do we really understand what that means? I think about us in Pella, Iowa, and those of us you know, living um, around the surrounding areas, what does sacrifice mean to us? What does that look like to you personally? So that was the first time that Jesus spoke uh, and predicted his death. Let's go to the second one. This is Mark 9. Um, okay, so 31. I'll start at 30. Um, so here... so. Peter obviously doesn't get it. The disciples don't get it, so Jesus has to do it again, right? Just like parents to our kids. Let me tell you again, and I think I've said before, adults usually have to hear something seven times before they actually uh, remember it. So here Jesus comes to them again, verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, they will rise. So here's Jesus telling them a second time that he's going to die. What's the disciples' reaction? We heard Peter's first reaction. What's her reaction the second time? But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. Fear. So when I, I got a, a, a question for you. Um, when uh, you ask someone or someone asks you, how are you doing? How are you doing? What's your typical response? I'm good. I'm great. So, uh, Katie, you want to show the next slide? This is, this is what most uh, reactions are. Hey. <laughs> I'm great. Right? I'm great. I'm the, um, that's our typical response. I know I do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'm great. Of course, I'm falling apart on the inside, but I'm great. Fear stops us from asking. 
it stopped the disciples from asking Christ about, hey, we don't understand. Like, what, what's going on? I know personally uh, many conversations that I've had even in the last 60 days about people that are hurting. People that sit in this room, people that sit in that room, people that I work with, people that I see randomly when I'm camping. I had, I had a deep conversation with a guy um, and he just started talking to me. People are hurting. And sometimes we don't take a chance or a moment to, to accept their great, their good, or even our, hey, I'm good, I'm great. So don't be like the disciples that were fearful about going deeper. I challenge us today, that's part of sacrifice, is saying, hey, let's be real. And that's why I love the auditorium so much, is that, you know what, We've, there's a lot of us have seen pain in life, and we're here because we want to go deeper. We want to experience the love of Christ. We want to experience his Holy Spirit in a deeper way. Because I've been on that side. I've been on the side of pain and hurt and confusion and darkness. And he gives us freedom in his sacrifice. So I ask you to, to go deeper next time. When you, when you see and you ask somebody how they're doing, and they said, hey, I'm good. Say, really? How are you really doing? So that's the second time that Jesus predicts his death. Let's go to the third time. Let's see if the disciples can get this or not. So we're going on to um, Mark chapter 10. Um, This is going to be verse 32 is where we're at. So let's see if Jesus can explain it to them one more time so they understand it. So Jesus again predicts his death. They were... They were on their way to, up to Jerusalem when Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside, and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the, to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So Jesus is going a little bit more descriptive, right? He was a little bit more vague. But he's still be very plain about this, right? He's speaking to them plainly. But he's going a little bit deeper about, hey, I'm going to be flogged. That I'm going to be given over to the chief priests. He's getting a little bit more specific about exactly what's going to happen. Do the disciples get it? No. So James and John, um, this is James and John's reaction. I think we got it up here. Uh, Let's go on. This is verse 35 of Mark 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said. I love this question. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. I know I do that a lot. Jesus, I want you to do, I want you to do for me whatever I ask. But Jesus' response is great, right? He's full of grace. Um, what do you want from me to do for you? He, said, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit on your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. This is Jesus' reply. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Obviously, they don't get what he's going to step into. Can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Here we've got the disciples are, I guess I look at the situation and I was like, really? I I was kind of thinking about this as I was preparing for today and I'm like, I I could just see um, James and John like, yeah, 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 yeah. We get the flogging and the beating and that kind of stuff and but, you know, me and my bro, we're like, we want to know, can we get some front row seats to the big show? I mean, can we, you know, left, right, hand, side? I mean, clearly, clearly they're not picking up on what's going to happen. The person they've been following and they've been right in his dirt, right? Right behind his sandals, eating his dust so that he could be clo- they could be close to the rabbi still are not getting it. And it drives me to, do I really get it? If the disciples live with him, 
drank with him, ate with him, saw miracles happen left and right, and they didn't get it. Do I? Do I get it? So this is a really a selfish reaction, right? It's a selfish desire. It's really not sacrifice. So what's the opposite of selfishness? Unselfishness, selflessness is the opposite of selfishness. I'm going to show you a video um, of a a father-son trio, or trio, father-son duo, and uh, the sacrifice. um, And we'll show the video and we'll talk about it. So can you want to show that video? So, I don't know if you've heard about Team Hoyt before. Uh, father, son, son uh, has cerebral palsy, uh, had it from uh, birth. And uh, one day, they, find, they got a computer set up uh, so that he could communicate. Obviously, he can't talk, can't walk. And uh, so they got the computer, and uh, they set it up, and he, when Rick, became, Rick Hoyt became a little bit older, he asked his dad, will you, there's a 5K charity um, uh, race, would you run that with me? And obviously you see he said yes, right? And when they got done running that race, um, the, the son said to his dad, he's like, I felt like I didn't have a disability when I ran, when you, when you ran with me. So he's like, hey, let's do some more. And so they talk about Team Hoyt, and they've, uh, you want to show the next slide, Caden? So 65 marathons. And obviously, the Iron Man, which is the one they were showing, where he is swimming, right? So I am, 
I'm swimming, I'm biking, I'm running. And he doesn't, and he, he even said, the, the dad said that when they did the 5K, he came in second to last. But was it about coming in second to last? No. So I guess I think, um, I think about sacrifice, and, I, and what, what does sacrifice mean? So I looked this up. I was, I was really, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I was struggling. I'm really, I'm still struggling. Like, what is my sacrifice? What am I really, really sacrificing? Am I, am, am I doing anything that's it's hard for me? Is it painful? And, and I really struggle with that, and I even came up with a list. I was like trying to come up with a list of what are the things I'm, I sacrifice, and let me tell you, the list was pretty short, and I was pretty disappointed. Here's the, here's the definition of sacrifice. An act of slaughtering an animal or a person or surrendering a possession as an offering to God. Surrendering a possession as an offering to God. So Jesus really is the standard. He is humble, he is faithful. And he is selfless. And we talked about each one of those times that the disciples heard about his death that they still did, they didn't understand. You know, Peter responded with pride saying, hey, whoa, you're crazy. What are you doing this for? I'm rebuking you. And the next one, the disciples were fearful, right? They were fearful to even ask to go deeper to understand, like, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? And then the last time, James and John were saying, hey, get us some front row seats in your kingdom, Complete selfishness. Jesus is a standard of sacrifice. He is humble, faithful, and selfless. Today, we're going to take communion, and I just think it's a perfect day for that. Um, we get to, to, to be free, right? We get to be free in a great country. We can come and worship here for the sacrifice that men and women have made for us on on our soil and on soil um, across the seas. So I really want you, I challenge you to think about, I want you to meditate. As we take the cup and the bread, I want you to meditate on the sacrifice and really ask yourself the question, do I understand the sacrifice, the humble, the faithful, and the selfless sacrifice that Christ made? I want you to reflect on your own personal sacrifice. I talked about myself. And let me tell you, my list is short. That's something I need to work on. What else do I need to sacrifice for my family, for my wife, for the kingdom? And then I want us to take another step towards sacrificial, sacrifice for others. We talked about when you ask that question and everything's great and everything's good, is that really the case? I'm a regular person, just like you guys, and my life is not perfect. I've got bones and skeletons in my closet. I struggle on a daily basis. And I challenge us to step into people's lives and to sacrifice. Because anytime you work with someone, you're going to pour out a little bit of yourself. And I ask you to do that. Pour out a little bit of yourself for someone else. To give a little bit of time. To give a little bit of maybe financial. But that's between you and the Lord.